excursions into the Encyclopedia Britannica are always interesting, if not always illuminating. In the 14th edition of this distinguished handbook, there is no entry of any kind under the word soul. It is simply completely ignored. Uh, turning to the older form, anima, by which the soul was recorded by Aristotle, we find no entry under that. Hopefully we turn to psyche to see if this will be more profitable. There is a brief entry under this word summarizing the fable of Cupid and Psyche, containing no intimation or suggestion that the word has any other meaning. So we turn to psychology and find there the opening statement, psychology is the science of the mind. Thus the soul, uh, as we are more or less inclined to think of it, receives no major heading in this work. Uh, there is no doubt that by checking the index we will find many articles bearing upon the religious and philosophical meaning of the concept of soul, but it rates no major entry, no mention. This is more or less uh, the result of a trend that has been going on now for better than a century, in which the effort has been consistently made to identify the internal life of man entirely with his mental and emotional structure. It has been taken for granted that all older concepts were more or less uh, exploratory. Uh, that uh, they were seeking to understand a certain internal part of man, but that all of this exploration has come more or less to naught, and what remains is the simple fact that inside of man is a mental instrument, and that this mental instrument, which also has emotional factors involved in it, may be and should be scientifically considered as the only soul that man has. This, of course, is utterly contrary uh, to the very institutions of philosophy from which even the term psychology originally came. Psychology does not mean literally the science of the mind. It means actually the science of the soul. But in order to have some comprehension of value in the use of this term, the soul, I think we must uh, spend some thought and consideration in trying to estimate how uh, the more ancient groups of people, scholars, mystics, philosophers, considered this part of knowledge this part of philosophy which deals with the human psyche or anima and its involvement in mortal concerns. Uh, there have always been two distinct points of view on this, and perhaps the conflict between them has led to the confusion of the present day. Uh, to one group, the soul represented the internal self. It represented, therefore, in broad terms, all of man apart from the body and its energies. The soul was, therefore, the person in the body. It was the soul that actually constituted the thinking, feeling, moving force within man. It was the soul that bestowed character. It was the soul that gradually, through the vicissitudes of life, came to dominate the material organism and transform it into an instrument for psychic purpose. The soul was therefore a true being in itself, more or less inhabiting the suburbs of an invisible universe. 
And it was the soul that, uh, animating the body, entering into it, transformed this body into a living thing. <coughs> so this concept of soul we find among most ancient religious and philosophic groups. There was a second group, however, possibly inspired by the early philosophies of the Egyptians, uh, that held that the soul was a kind of overtone of the body, that the soul actually was something uh, like the Greek idea of the immortal mortal. The soul had a beginning because it arose from man's internal reflection. It had an origin because it was created out of the very life of man. But having once come into existence, it became an eternal thing, unfolding and developing from the mysterious psychic seed that had been planted in the structure of nature from the very beginning. Thus, to these people, the soul was like a flower or a plant with its seed in the dark and mysterious earth of man's spiritual nature, and its blossom radiating out into the various phases of enlightenment which man attained uh, through his evolutionary process. It was the soul that really constituted uh, the body of experience. It was fashioned out of the labors of man. The twelve labors of Hercules contributed to the creation of the soul. And that being in which there was a mature soul, or a soul grown up in wisdom and experience, was a hero, a person of great spiritual endowment. The soul, therefore, really constituted an over-self, much in the quality of Emerson's over-soul. But this over-self was something that man had to build. Much as in our ordinary way of life, man builds through experience his attitudes, his character, his disposition, his temperament, and the very maturity to which he ultimately attains. The soul growing up in man, therefore, was like a person passing through life, learning as it proceeded, gaining certain lessons, than accomplishing in older years a kind of wisdom, a wisdom arising out of living itself. The soul was consequently this wisdom body. It was this enriching character within man, becoming ever more, and by its own growth leading the body in ways of wisdom and truth. The Eastern peoples more or less follow this same concept except that they extend the pattern to make what we might term the psychic self as something which evolves not through a single lifetime, but along the whole chain of re-embodiments included in the concept of reincarnation. Thus the soul is that which is re-embodied. It is that which continues to grow behind the changing faces and forms of embodiment. Uh, the soul begins with man, begins with his earliest evolution, but continues in an unbroken sequence of growth, passing from one body to another, gaining some new instruction, insight, or understanding from each embodiment. And it is the soul and not the person that grows richer in wisdom. The soul, therefore, becomes at any given point or time in the evolution of consciousness, the leader of the personality. Within the soul is locked the experience of previous lives, meaning that in some instances we observe persons born with greater erudition and insight than others. We see some more skilled and more gifted. We see the rise of genius. We behold those whose aptitudes and abilities are extraordinary. To the Eastern mind, these represent soul endowments accumulated through the long cycles of rebirth. So we do have two essential concepts, one being that the soul is the person, is the being, the other that the soul is this something that grows up between body and spirit, filling the interval between the two, 
acting as a bridge, a bridge which becomes stronger and more adequate for the transmission of consciousness from within or experience from without. It is around this concept that the soul is something that is building with man, uh, that psychology gained, gained its consolation and differentiated its own point of view. Psychology, however, has usually taken it for granted that man has only a single embodiment. Therefore, that the soul has its origin, its growth, its maturity, and its end within the span of a human lifetime. But it is in the soul, even in this concept, that what we might term the richest part of life is unfolded. It is the soul also which becomes the source of the various pressures and intensities which mark individuality. It is this soul, variously conditioned according to science by both heredity and environment, that the individual must turn to for the understanding of his own inner life. His life consists not only of his conscious experience, but of certain subconscious or unconscious experiences, which can become powerful forces in the modification of his character. So we come to certain simple concepts about this, by which we translate certain levels of activity in terms of psychology. We say the conscious mind is that part of man's mental life which responds normally to the various stimuli which are the expectances of living. We can say, for, therefore, that two persons, A and B, may be involved in this. A uh, is a friend of B. B has always been kind to A. Therefore, A is fond of B. There seems to be no problem here. We can explain the reason for this like in the natural tendencies and temperaments of these people. We find there is no mystery whatever in the association of these two persons. Each is reacting according to obvious circumstances, circumstances which we can explain without any consideration of dark, mysterious elements. But we may take another A and B for a momentary comparison. A and, and knows B. And from the first day he met B, A heartily disliked him. B has done nothing to injure A. B is not aware of any reason why this antagonism should exist. B naturally likes A, but A naturally dislikes B. Now why? This problem is no longer so easy of solution. We can no longer put together some evident and obvious elements and say this is cause and effect. We now find A reacting in a manner inconsistent with environmental phenomena. A is not fulfilling expectancy. A is under some kind of a conditioned pressure. So the problem must arise to find out, if we can, why A, who has not been injured by B, and may have received favors from him, still dislikes him. To find the answer to this, psychology seeks to probe into the subconscious part of man's mind. It seeks to discover if possible hidden reasons for the animosity that exists. One of the simplest of all these hidden reasons could be similarity, or perhaps association. It is quite possible that sometime in his life A has known someone resembling B. This other person in some way was unfair or unkind to A. Therefore, when A meets B for the first time, uh, this old hurt, this wound, this uh, unhappy situation is refocused, and A associates B with a previous injury. Thus, he naturally has an antagonism which will remain unless he is a big enough person to overcome the subconscious prejudice. Here we see another type of pressure moving less obviously under the surface of A's personality. Out of the study of A's secret pressures, therefore, a certain type of psychology has been developed. 
It has attempted to discover the reason for unreasonable mental and emotional conduct. To some degree, it has been successful in this, but in some cases it has been almost completely unsuccessful. Also within this area, there is another problem with which psychology has been still less adequate. And that is where it is not a matter of A disliking B, but that A has a deep and wonderful gift for music or art, and B has none of these characteristics. Uh, B is comparatively giftless. He is simply an extremely ordinary person. A is an extraordinary person. Now, the question of the psychological uh, pressures of excellence, this question is more difficult to solve than that of prejudice. Uh, the answer we would naturally seek in the classical way, whether A has been subjected to some environment in which he had peculiar advantages over B in the attainment of genius. Uh, this uh, may or may not be a fruitful line of research. Probably three quarters of the time it is fruitless. The next question is, can we trace this from heredity? Is it possible that uh, in the background of A there have been great artists and great musicians and great uh, 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 achievements, even those several generations back. Uh, tracing this is, of course, increasingly difficult as we retire where fewer and fewer records are available. But often there is almost nothing to indicate uh, that this is the solution. It may well be that A comes from a family of five children. Of these five, he alone is talented, or all the others share in the same heredity. This offers question which uh, is at the moment more or less shelved for future consideration. It will not fit in to the approved pattern of things, but the human mind is very slow to change patterns that seem to be reasonably satisfactory whether they are applicable or not. So we then have to uh, try to find out, if possible, uh, how it happens uh, that A has entirely different endowments from B or from other members of his own family. And this would seem to point out the necessity of increasing the perspective on the psychic life of man to include more than one embodiment. It would seem necessary to assume that A carries a potential, that this potential came from somewhere, and that this potential was not some, an accident. It was not something that was merely fortuitously bestowed. It is easy enough to fill the universe with accidents if we want to think this way. But uh, this thought very, uh, very seldom contributes anything to the advancement of concrete knowledge. We must then assume that all abilities have their origin in some reasonable cause. And here's where psychology gets itself into one of its primary difficulties. Being unable to explain any cause that is consistent with its own concepts, psychology is forced to fall back upon an abstract concept of heredity that cannot be demonstrated for lack of data, or it must fall back upon the a uh, fortuitous belief that somewhere in the environment, recognized or unrecognized, the solution to the mystery must lie. Or else it must take the ground and circumstance that some individuals are endowed and some are not, for no good reason. Psychology has been dealing with the problem of no good reason for some time. It has been forced to assume too many accidents, and it has also been forced to associate the individual with too many modifying circumstances over which he has no control. From this approach, we finally come to the principal dilemma from a moral and ethical standpoint which psychology faces, namely that it forces upon us an amoral universe, a universe in which there are no values, where things simply happen and there is no excuse for their happening. There is no reason why one individual should try harder than another, 
because there is no probability that effort will ever be actually rewarded. Rewards are not in terms of efforts, they are in terms of accidents. While this in the very abstract laboratory approach may be comparatively meaningless and contribute very little to the complication of human life, when this reaches out into society and becomes a dominant thought or a dominant opinion or a dominant belief, it does and has undermined man's ethical moral life. It has given him a peculiar attitude toward things an attitude essentially unlawful and meaningless, an attitude in which values as such no longer have any distinguishing boundaries, a universe in which anything can happen and nearly everything does, and there is no particularly good explanation for the greater part of it. The ancients would not accept this. Perhaps they were too simple in their thinking, too direct to acknowledge such a concept. Perhaps they were too wise to accept it. But in any event, they, will, they would not build their universe upon this idea of incident and accident. They insisted that all things in nature had reasons, had explanations, that everything that occurred occurred according to some reasonable pat plan, pattern, law, or truth. Consequently, that the differences in human life, human behavior, human attitude, human estates must be lawful differences, not accidental differences. And the only way they could solve this was by extending the lifespan of the human being uh, so that that which was not accomplished in the present life could be traced to a previous embodiment. And that which was not worked out or fulfilled in this life must be extended into a subsequent embodiment. In the ancient concept, the primary end was that justice should be universally applied, whereas at the present time, the concept of justice has very little place in most scientific thinking. It has no uh, bearing upon the psychology of accidents with which we are so heavily dominated in modern thinking. Now, psychology has as its theoretical uh, achievements two ends, both of which are regarded as essentially useful, and within certain reasonable boundaries they are useful. One is psychoanalysis and the other is psychotherapy. Psychoanalysis is the effort to understand man, to understand the reasons for his attitudes and for the various unreasonable uh, emotions and thoughts that arise in it. Under analysis, a certain amount can be demonstrated. It can be shown, for example, how dangerous prejudice can be. We gain a very valuable insight into the reason for unaccountable pressures that distort the person, which uh, damage the individual himself, which bring upon him numerous misfortunes in life. It has been well demonstrated in a number of cases that the individual, heavily burdened by internal intensities, can damage his life, his health, his career, and his social standing by uh, uh, permitting these ancient grievances of his own temperament uh, to continue to dominate action. Thus, if the person becomes too pressureful as the result of incidents which occurred in this lifetime, if the individual has reacted badly to all the experiences of life, if he has fallen under the glamour of self-pity, if he has inordinate ambitions, if he is determined to achieve his own ends regardless of cost to others, Whatever unnatural, unreasonable, and un unethical intensity may affect him will certainly bring with it results that are detrimental to his happiness and peace of mind. Psychology, then, shows that a bad disposition does nobody any good, and this is a very basic and valuable discovery. The only answer that they do not seem to be able to work out at the present time 
is what to do with a congenital bad disposition. How it happens that some individuals seemingly bo are born in the objective case and never get over it. How it happens that some persons are difficult from the beginning, easily inclined to neurosis, likely to take the wrong angles and the wrong views of everything, whereas others, born in the same families, under the same social conditions, in the same races, and in the same countries, are much more docile, easily regulated, and more idealistic and constructive in their points of view. Uh, these problems are still tossed back into the mysterious bin of heredity and must remain there until some wiser solution is found. But there has been sufficient to prove beyond doubt the simple fact of mental hygiene, namely that as the individual thinks, he will pay in terms of happiness and health. Now, the psychoanalysis dealing with this phase of the problem de leads naturally to psychotherapy. How are we going to get the individual out of his bad habits? This has resulted in a break into uh, smaller schools of most of the larger psychological streams. Uh, there have been many different groups arise, each of which has a different approach to this problem of psychotherapy. Some hold that the most important thing is to place the, un the individual under counseling, uh, to keep him extroverting his pressures until he exhausts them. Others feel that the individual can gradually be taught to appreciate by a kind of inward experience the quality of his own mistake, and out of this will come uh, gradually a rescuing or restoring of normalcy by the effort of the patient himself. Others have resorted to hypnosis, drug therapy, and everything that can be devised by modern science to help the individual to fight the tensions which his own pressures and dispositional intensities have created within him. To a measure, this type of psychotherapy has been helpful. It is especially helpful in advanced cases of psychiatry. But all in all, we cannot say that psychology as it is today is a perfect art or even nearly a complete science. Such is not the case. It is still a dependency, dependent upon the large structure of philosophy for its realities, for its integrities, and for its survival. Fortunately, uh, the present trend is toward this realization. And where a few years ago uh, the psychologist was a very complacent person, certain that he had the final key to human happiness, he is now far less certain of this, and part of his increasing modesty is due to the circumstances of contemporary life. He is discovering, rather to his amazement, that although we have more psychologists than ever before, we have more mental illness than ever before. He is beginning to sense that something else is necessary, and that psychology without certain internal integrations within its own structure can contribute to problems rather than to their solution. And working on this problem, psychology is concerned today more and more with the restoration of an ethical structure. In other words, it is seeking to be re-identified with the principal stream of philosophical descent. In the mystical way of looking at all of these problems, the classical psychology, uh, the ancients accepted certain facts that modern psychologists are loath to accept. They accepted, for example, the existence in man of a spiritual energy or a divine life principle. That this divine life principle animates all things, uh, supplying them uh, with their life requirements very much as the sun animates all of nature and sustains the infinite diversity of growth and unfoldment every, everywhere obvious in the natural world. That this inner light or life or power should be termed a spirit or spiritual principle is only consistent with the early experiences of human beings. Therefore, the ancients, for the most part, some exceptions, for the most part held the validity of a spiritual principle, that man was 
a motion of life through time and space, that this life had a certain fixedness in it somewhere, that this life was something doing something. It was not merely a series of interrelated phenomena with no essential basis. This life itself, according to the ancients, had as its primary purpose a mysterious motion called evolution or ideation. This life at some primordial time prior to man's ability to restore uh, such conditions in nature uh, was immersed within a material principle from which it gradually evolved what we call body. The ancients symbolized this primary union of life and matter uh, in the seed or the form of life in which the life itself is locked within some kind of a shell. This life, locked within matter, gradually unfolded, gradually strengthened, gradually flowed out, producing the phenomenon of growth. This growth we observe everywhere. We observe it in the growth of plants, of trees, of animals. Uh, we see it whenever we look around us in nature. We see things growing mysteriously but majestically even as the great tree grows from the tiny acorn. And we seem to behold in this nature's eternal process of unfoldment. And according to most ancient peoples, uh, spirit was unfolding through body. And in the process of its own unfoldment, it unfolded the body which it occupied. Therefore, it was the spirit itself that was forever building nobler mansions for its own purposes. The ancients recognized spirit and matter as the polarized opposites of a universal essence or principle. They did not regard matter as something apart from spirit, but as a condition of it. They did not represent or figure spirit as being isolated from matter. Rather, they regarded spirit and matter uh, as the polarities of one eternal agent. A man's spiritual life descending from the mysterious roots and sources in the unknown, uniting itself with body, uh, and soul body, and transform body into a living thing. Body rising from the earth, passing through the you know, infinite diversity of manifestation, which we call the evolutionary process, uh, gradually unfolded its own potentials from a monocellular organism into the compound being which we call man. The action of life upon matter caused matter to take upon itself design or purpose. It was as though, as the uh, German mystic Davy says, life placed its seal upon matter. And matter, therefore, received the impression of this seal and manifested the design inscription or monogram that was placed upon or cut into the seal. Uh, Baby calls this seal and its impression the signatura rerum. It is the great signature of the divine power. Now, when life seals matter with its monogram or its mysterious heraldic device, the uh, seal itself is called form. For the union of life and matter always results in a compound, and this compound is a form, a form consisting of material elements held into some kind of a pattern by energy. This form, like the mysterious geometry of snowflakes, means that something has crystallized around patterns, around a magnificent geometry of life itself. And the ancients held that man was a compound consisting of this mingling and fusion of life and matter and that as a result of this mixture or co-mixture of this chemical process in the universe, man became what we see, what we know, what we experience today. He became a, an informed or formalized 
being. Now, as the union of spirit and matter produced form, so according to the ancient belief, this fu fusion also produced a mysterious thing called soul. Soul was therefore the invisible counterpart of the fusion of spirit and matter. And then man became a, a creature possessing a form, possessing faculties, powers, perceptions, reflections, the capacity for meditation and concentration. When he developed the mysteries of memory and forethought and intuition and inspiration, as these powers began to develop within him, they resulted in the gradual development of a new creature. This new creature had a body similar to the bodies of animals. He had a life eternal in the light of God. But between this body and this spirit, there was emerging, evolving, and unfolding a mysterious individuality. This individuality was the person. This individuality was man, or manas, the ancient uh, Sanskrit root word for man, also meaning the thinker. Thus man became a living, thinking being. And with his living and thinking, he reacted in an, in an infinitude of ways to the challenge of his environment. We can trace this evolution back to the Stone Age. We can trace it back to the time when man first desired to perpetuate the records of his own kind by making crude drawings and sculpturings upon the walls of caves and on the faces of cliffs. We can see his struggle through the beginning of arts and sciences. We can see him discovering fire. We can find him gaining gradually skill in the hunt. We find him inventing weaving and pottery, little by little advancing himself. Other creatures that we know did not do these things. Some showed rudimentary tendencies to social organization, as the ant and the bee, but they never developed beyond a certain degree. We find man, however, going on and on, not only adjusting himself to the world in which he lived, but gradually developing the abstract faculties of the mind. We find him speculating and thinking about things. We find a religion arising in his consciousness. And little by little, this fusion of spirit and matter, producing, as we say, the rudimentary principle of mind, began to enrich this mind. And this mind, in turn, began to enrich the life of the person in the material world. And by degrees, over vast periods of time, the mind took leadership over the body, and more and more used the body for its own purposes. Man no longer simply existed to survive. As soon as mind began to take over, man began to think in terms of leisure. Man began to contemplate the possibility of an inner life apart from the mere struggle for survival. Out of leisure came the arts and sciences, the philosophies, the literatures, all of the music, the theater, the drama, dance, every development of man's psychic life. These all came from the leisure or the power of the individual to have a life inside, to have a life which it was not necessary to completely smother in order to maintain physical existence. So man gradually began to conspire on how to gain for himself greater freedom from the stress of material need. He learned by degrees how to save the seed and augment the crops. He learned how, by industry to make useful devices. He invented light so that his hours of darkness would not be so complete, and he would have greater time for contemplating life. Little by little, therefore, the human being built up between spirit and body a structure of experiences, a structure rich in the story of the struggle of an inner being to express itself. Now, uh, religion may in some instances identify this inner being totally with spirit. But the animal has spirit. The bird, the fish, the insect, all these creatures have spirits. They are all alive. 
They are just as much alive as man, but they have never individualized this mysterious middle ground. They have never taken life and gradually given it a certain integration. They have never created the power to create leisure for themselves. They have never found the way to use this leisure. If these other creatures had ever uh, gained this power and this skill, they would probably have long ago overwhelmed man, because they outnumber him, and in many ways they are infinitely more resourceful than he is. But they have never had this sense, this mysterious power uh, of gaining mastery over destiny. So we find uh, gradually in this middle distance between spirit and matter the arising of the true human being. We find him, therefore, suspended twixt heaven and earth, dominion wielding. He is like the Chinese triad of heaven, earth, and man. For in man heaven and earth are locked and they are also revealed. Man, through his own individuality, is gradually revealing the universe, and in so doing he is also exploring, discovering, contemplating universal phenomena. Thus the ancients were convinced that there existed this soul in body, that this soul was the highest expression that we have of the manifestation of universal energy that it was a particular manifestation, that it was a highly personal one. The human soul cannot belong to anything except man. And the human soul could not come into existence until man became a self-responsible agent. The human soul has to gradually gain through experience. The human soul has to react to pleasure and pain. It has to discover its mistakes, it has to advance its virtues, it has to punish its defects, until finally, because it has individuality, because it has a certain uh, moderate determinism which it calls free will, this soul is capable of growth, capable of becoming. It is also capable of limiting or delaying its own growth, but because this growth is part of universal life itself, it cannot completely destroy the power of itself to grow. It can damage this power, but it cannot frustrate its purposes. Thus man arises as the son of heaven and earth. He arises as having been endowed by nature with the richest part of natural heritage, and endowed by the divine principle uh, with the potentials of his own divinity. Man then is indeed a creature in whose nature uh, the ultimates and the extremes of existence are both bridged and reconciled. On this basis, then, we have the concept of the soul as it was understood by the Greeks and by most other ancient peoples. And because this psychic power gradually gained the knowledge of itself, and gained the power to contemplate its own structure, its own majesty, and its own manifestation through the study of its consequences as a force in life. So man began to develop a science of his own soul. He gradually developed realizations of how the soul could be advanced in its purpose, how it could be retarded, what would enrich it, what would impoverish it, he also gradually came to know the needs of the soul, what was necessary to its growth and happiness, its normalcy and order. Plato gives us a considerable discussion of this particular subject. And like most of the Greek philosophers, he assumed that finally the soul was a geometrical equation. It was a kind of mathematical creature. It was a creature that could be best symbolized by numbers, and by their arrangements, and by the unfoldment of the symmetrical platonic solids. The soul also, in addition to all of these other characteristics, according to the Greeks, being, so to say, uh, a product of the union of heaven and earth, 
uh, could be lured away from its middle place by the various circumstances of life. The soul was perilously poised on the roaring ridge of heaven. It was truly uh, in a middle ground or middle distance between extremes. And man's own abilities to maintain the equilibrium of the soul, these abilities determined very largely the health or sickness of his own psychic self. If the soul uh, was caused by the intemperances of living uh, to verge toward the body and become identical with it, then the individual was termed a materialist or a sensualist. Then it was that the soul, instead of regulating the body, became its slave. This is the allegory behind the story of Samson, who, having been blinded, was bound to the millstone of the Philistines. This uh, soul that is blinded by materialism becomes, as it were, bound to the millstone of the material world and its problems, grinding out corn for profit, continually enslaved by the very body which was fashioned for its purpose and for its unfoldment. As the soul went or uh, verged nearer and nearer to body, it was said to enter into a stupor or to become obsessed or possessed by body. It became numb and intoxicated with the pressures of the senses until finally this soul descended into a darkness, losing all sense of its own existence, forgetting that it was a living thing, and remembering no part of its divine origin a point again brought out for the, fa the parable of the prodigal son and in the Gnostic legends by the uh, hymn of the robe of glory. The soul having thus lost all sense of its, own e of its own divinity, of its own nobility, became simply uh, an instrument for the gratification of the sensory perception. Its thoughts were only in terms of the comforts of the body, the fulfillment of material ambition. It dealt in stratagems and spoils. It became a victim of conspiracies, and the mental powers which it possessed were used for tyranny, despotism, and deceit. Thus Plato describes the most unhappy and miserable state of the soul, in which it is therefore said essentially to enter into a state of hell. For as both the Greeks and Egyptians pointed out, hell was simply the soul imprisoned within body, uh, limited by the tyrannies of the sensory perceptions, pressed on by the demoniacal forces of deceit, selfishness, and ignorance, and no longer capable of an existence in itself or even the awareness of its own nobility. Conversely, the soul, suspended in the middle distance between the divine and mortal, could verge toward the divine, could ascend from the tyranny of the body, and incline itself more and more to the contemplation of heavenly things. Uh, when the soul chose to join itself to the eternal source of its own being, uh, this soul was said to become an idealist no longer accepting the tyranny of body, renouncing those procedures and processes which might bind it uh, to the delusion of the sensory perceptions. The soul sought rather the rarefied atmosphere of intuition and vision. Thus it was, according to the Greeks, that the soul might be raised up or lifted up by a mystery, uh, so that it was no longer uh, locked within a body, uh, that the compound being no longer regarded the soul merely as the mental part of its own anatomy, but rather viewed it as a glorious winged creature uh, capable of soaring into the very presence of truth itself. Uh, the ancient mysteries of the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Hindus, and other uh, nations which possessed the secret religious systems 
These ancient mysteries had as their purpose the separation of the soul from the body without death. For it was assumed that this was a kind of philosophic death in which the soul, transcending body and ascending from it, attained liberty or freedom and existed in the pure air of reality even while the person was still embodied in a material constitution. The soul which thus liberated itself from body, even though still embodied, was also then believed to have attained an immortality. For the soul, once liberated by its own insight, could not in that embodiment or in any other future embodiment ever lose this enlightenment, because the soul in its own nature could not be embodied. And once it was free from the primordial ignorance which it brought with it from the beginning, once it had matured beyond the condition of ignorance. It could no longer be forced into that ignorance. It could no longer again be identified with body, so that while this person might be born again many times, he would be born and would at an early age or in coming maturity achieve the realization of the dignity of his own soul. This was the concept around which the primitive psychology of the ancients was built. It was built on the great concept of liberating the soul from sensuality. Liberating the soul not by forceful measures, not by some desperate discipline, but liberating it by persuasion, by gradually inviting it to contemplate nobility, by instructing it in the noblest and most gracious of the arts and sciences, by perfecting it in philosophy and religious insight, and by inspiring it uh, to seek continuously and unfailingly for the spiritual source of its own life. It was this soul, therefore, that attaining a certain immortality was ultimately, as described by Pythagoras in the Golden Verses, reunited again with the divine power from which it came. This is the panorama of psychology as the ancients held it to be. We can see how modern psychology is a fragment of this, but lacking a larger picture, lacking the great moral inducements, lacking the great ethical institutions, lacking these systems of meditation and contemplation which led to the purification of the soul, lacking even a philosophy for the emancipation of the psychic life from bondage to matter, psychology cannot bring about the final end which it seeks to attain. It must therefore uh, remain forever a, a partial science unless it finally re-accepts into itself the full structure of the ancient learning to which it once belonged. Now, in addition to the problem of psychology, we must turn to the next phase of our problem, which is epistemology. Uh, the word epistemology comes from a Greek word which means knowledge. And the main problem and concern of epistemology is to discover the nature of knowledge. And this is a question which is of great importance to thoughtful people and no importance to the thoughtless. Many individuals have no interest whatever in knowledge. They accept certain things as knowable and certain things as not knowable, and that is the end. Or they think of knowledge as opposed to ignorance. Knowledge being that which they know, ignorance that which others know. This situation we find everywhere in human experience. There are very few persons, regardless of the inconveniences under which they subject themselves, will admit that they do not know. Uh, yet, actually, if we begin the study of knowledge, it helps to maintain in us an appropriate humility. What? is knowledge. Here is a very difficult thing to define. Even the word itself presents great difficulties. For those who are not thoughtful, there are never any difficulties. But at the same time, there are never any results. But to the more cautious, to the more considerate, the problem of knowledge must presume something else. Knowledge can only exist if there is something to be known. 
Knowledge must therefore be dependent entirely upon the validity of that which can be known. Now, modern attitudes toward knowledge are quite different again from those of our classical ancestors. Uh, modern uh, individuals, particularly those following the humanistic persuasions, uh, are inclined to assume that all knowledge must be rel relative on the ground that ultimates do not exist until they occur. Therefore, there can be no knowledge beyond the condition of the moment. And the condition of another moment must be analyzed at another time. If there is no master plan, if growth is simply a growing up in space, and all growth itself is determined primarily by incident and accident, then we have no ground for more than relative knowledge. We cannot assume that there is any grand plan of existence. If we are therefore to assume that we are making the only plan there is, that there can be no plan apart from us or others of our kind somewhere in space, if space is growing up only because of the pressure of growth within it, is growing up in isolation and by uh, chance alone. If everything has the right to become anything that it wants to be, and there is no boundary except the boundary imposed by the effort of that which is growing, then we have no absolute knowledge. We can only have, we, we might say, an absolute fact, namely the fact of infinite growth uh, without any supervision of any kind. That this universe is like a field of weeds that will keep on uh, going forever simply because of the tenacity of the weeds themselves. The classical point of view on this again differed from that of the average modern position. For most ancient nature, nations established a concept of archetypes. They insisted that somewhere in the infinite mind of things, in the eternal nature of the creating power itself, was a plan. that this plan has always existed, that life is fulfilling a plan, that growth is ordered, that things are growing from something to something, that all growth is leading in a direction predestined and foreordained before the beginning of the world, to use a good old scriptural term. Therefore, that there is somewhere a final, inevitable group of realities. These realities, known or unknown, recognized or unrecognized, acknowledged or denied, remain the same. Nothing changes them. Man may shake his fist at them forever, but he does not diminish them in any way. The individual may live many lives without knowing that they exist, but nevertheless they exist within him and he in them from the beginning. The concept of archetype would assume, therefore, that in the mind of God, reality is a fact, that reality exists. Therefore, that in the nature of mind of God abides what we would call absolute knowledge. Now, this is absolute knowledge to the degree that we recognize deity as absolute life. If we re recognize deity as a conditioned existence, then we must recognize the knowledge possessed by deity as a conditioned knowledge. 
But up to the present time, we have never reached a point where we dare to speculate too greatly on this final problem. We have to assume that for us, absolute knowledge is the full and complete knowing of the universal plan or purpose for which we were intended and for which the universe was created and toward which both ourselves and the universe are moving inevitably. The moment we acknowledge or accept the fact of a, of a universal all-including and all-inclusive plan, we then contemplate on what we can know about it. And then epistemology posits the next question. A man is a conditioned creature. He exists with a certain group of faculties. He exists with a certain mental development. This differs somewhat in all persons, but the whole gamut of it, as manifested on this planet by human beings, is a comparatively narrow field. If we divide uh, or create a concept covering the knowledge of the person who knows the least of all men, and the person who knows the most of all men, we are still within a comparatively narrow limit of knowledge. That the human being, then, if he is a conditioned being in the process of moving from a present state to a better state, it is assumed that the knowledge that he can possess now is the knowledge of his present state or at his present state. And that if tomorrow he is a better person, he can tomorrow have a greater knowledge. Therefore, man's power to know unfolds with himself. And that uh, because of this, the individual in this world can never be absolutely certain unless he is absolutely perfect. And as perfection of this measure is a rarity, to say the least, there does not seem to be a superabundance of absolute knowledge. Ethically, we go into the next question, naturally. Is absolute ne knowledge necessary to a creature possessing only finite capacities? Is it necessary that the finite should understand the infinite? Probably it is not necessary, but it is part of man's ambition to overestimate himself and out of a little knowledge to assume that he is worthy of a greater knowledge. But we do know certain things within the range of epistemological thinking, namely that knowledge can be increased in man to some degree in the course of even a single lifetime. We may say, therefore, that the child who has been to school has more knowledge than the infant. We may assume that the, more, the mature human being has more knowledge of some kind than the child, and that the person who has lived out his fourscore years of a rich life of experience has more knowledge than a young person in their teens or twenties. All the things being otherwise equal, equal, we therefore say that there are two ways in which knowledge can be increased, first by education and second by experience. Uh, these two forms, therefore, gradually increase the knowledge which the person possesses, but this increase is usually limited to a comparatively narrow area of material needs, responsibilities, or desires. The person experiencing material things becomes learned in them. An individual going to school becomes informed in the arts and sciences of his times and conditions. But it cannot be said that either of these persons has broken through the comparatively narrow boundaries of material knowing or material information. Epistemology then brings out the question, 
Are there other ways of knowing? And epistemology does not say that knowledge has to be limited to education and experience. But it points out that these form a simple example of how knowledge can increase even upon one level of activity. Knowledge does not, however, transcend that level so long as it is related to the education and the experience of that level alone. Philosophy also points out that by certain interior attainments above the ordinary, based perhaps upon the advantages of being embodied with a more mature soul than that to be found in another person, certain individuals possess a greater degree of essential knowledge than others. By essential knowledge, we now mean knowledge which enriches life rather than merely enriches living. A knowledge by means of which the internal and eternal values of existence uh, become more clearly comprehensible to consciousness itself. And the world has produced certain heroic persons, great religious leaders, great inspired teachers, of whom it may most reasonably be said that their knowledge of essential values has exceeded that of the average individual. It may not necessarily be said, however, that even the greatest of these has become all-knowing. Thus we observe that by various conditions, circumstances, or by various means, uh, certain individuals uh, have a larger allotment of essential knowledge. This essential knowledge they have conveyed to others. Uh, the uh, transmission of this essential knowledge may be called higher learning. Higher now in the sense of deeper or richer learning. Higher in the sense of being beyond and above the common knowledge which we use in the performance of the various tasks of the day. Epistemology therefore points out that all these sources together may be said to constitute one grand part of knowledge. Knowledge arising from experience, knowledge arising from education, knowledge arising from contemplation and meditation, and knowledge arising from the practices of rational disciplines within the person himself. Now, epistemology says, does this sum up the entire pattern of possible knowing? And it adds one other, a highly controversial factor, namely the possibility of knowledge from within the being itself. Knowledge conveyed or communicated by consciousness directly to the mind or to the outer faculties of man. Uh, this kind of knowledge has been termed illumination, uh, the mystical experience, cosmic consciousness, or as uh, some of the uh, older mystical Christian writers called it, knowledge which is inspiration, or perhaps knowledge which is bestowed by God. This type of knowledge, uh, epistemology acknowledges. It accepts that such type of knowledge is possible, but points out that by the very nature of it, it presents certain inevitable difficulties. Difficulties which can be cheerfully overlooked or even denied, but whether we deny them or overlook them, they still remain also factual and unchanging. The first problem of internal knowledge or inspiration, or uh, we might say the grace of God conferring insight, this peculiar situation 
uh, has to be judged again in terms of consequences, which are the only guides that we have. And we observe that so-called inner knowledge is not always in agreement. That individuals having visions, insight, mystical experiences are not always in agreement as to the facts resulting from these experiences. We know also that so-called intuitions and inspirations may or may not prove justified. We know that individuals claiming visions or peculiar insight have frequently been wrong. Therefore, we cannot say that these visions are inevitably true simply because they come from the inside of human consciousness. Psychology steps in here and points out that almost any mental or emotional attitude arising in man can be colored or discolored by the psychic interval through which it has to pass. Thus we can say that empirically speaking, it is perfectly possible for an absolute knowledge to exist in the nature of God and this knowledge to be revealed to a large degree, perhaps not absolutely, but to a degree beyond the ordinary communications of knowledge, and that this communication is possible by an inward experience called mystical, or a, of an illumination, or an enlightenment, or a spiritual attainment by means of which the individual uh, shares to an exalted degree insight into the realities of life. Epistemology covers this, affirming that it is possible, affirming that it has occurred, but not willing to commit itself as to whether even such experiences are absolute. In other words, whether it is possible absolutely for the finite or the conditioned fragments of, of which we call human consciousness to possess or to communicate either from its own source to its own mind or from its own mind to other minds the absolute knowledge of reality. The general tendency had this view has been to say that theoretically it is possible. Practically it has not been known to occur. But as against this absolute factor, there has been a great deal of relative transmission of knowledge, vastly in excess of that commonly available to man. And there has been undoubtedly legitimate internal inspiration, illumination, and uh, mystical insight arising from the nature of man himself. And it has also been assumed in epistemology that in practical, in practical consideration by all the laws of reason, this knowledge as, uh, coming from within or arising in the inner life of man is the most direct knowledge which man is capable of receiving, inasmuch as it has less losses through transmission, that it is also experienced immediately rather than merely being communicated, and that everything else being equal, experienced inner knowledge is more, more valid than communicated knowledge which must pass through various channels to reach the sensory perceptions of the individual. So epistemology is concerned with all of these problems, but it is further also concerned with the practical application of the concepts of these problems. And I think in this phase epistemology moves very close and into very intimate association with both Eastern and Western mysticism. If it does give us a vision or a concept of a universal process, it must, by a you know, virtue of uh, philosophy itself, 
uh, give us some, in, some insight as to how these ends can be attained, how the individual can increase in essential knowledge, how he can use knowledge more effectively in the maintenance of his own life, and perhaps uh, with more understanding in relationship with other people. I believe that the first quality which epistemology is inclined to bestow is modesty, a, mo a most seemly and becoming virtue. Modesty arising in this science is based upon the extraordinary difficulties attendant upon essential knowledge. Therefore, that the probabilities uh, that as one individual has it in greater abundance than another. Um, these such probabilities are relative rather than absolute. Epistemology teaches us, first of all, not that others are probably wrong, but uh, perhaps that we ourselves are probably wrong. That we cannot dogmatize that the individual who makes unconditioned, unqualified assertions of abstractions is not true simply because he makes such assertions. That anyone can assert, but that the only, that the only one who is able uh, to be sure is a person whose total knowledge, whose total consciousness has been greatly elevated. In the Western systems, the mysteries sought to communicate the laws of such elevation. And in the Eastern mystical systems, Buddhism, Vedanta, and Yoga have attempted to achieve the same end. All knowledge, whether it comes from inside or outside, is subject to the damage wrought by the psychic integration or disintegration of the individual. An individual under intense psychic pressure reduces the probability of their ability to possess essential knowledge. Regardless of what they know, the pure stream of knowledge is disfigured by their own intensity. An individual in whose nature hatred or greed or avarice or uh, intemperance or intolerance uh, strongly exist, such a person is incapable of a clear channel for the dissemination of essential knowledge. Uh, knowledge cannot escape the contamination of the instruments through which it passes. Therefore, a knowledge which in its substance and in its essence may be beautiful is profaned to become a tyrannical error if the instrument through which it passes lacks grace of spirit and insight and tenderness and gentleness and charity. So it was assumed by all ancient peoples that the most important of all channels for the communication of knowledge is the internal channel that knowledge is communicated, essential knowledge, most directly between consciousness and the mind and finally through the sensory perceptions of the individual himself. But what we call the psychic focus is therefore the point uh, where knowledge moving from its invisible causes flows into visible expression in some form either it is put into thoughts, or into words, or into forms and colors, or into formulas of one kind or another. But this knowledge is always moving through the psychic integration of the person. And if this integration is poor, the consequence must be inadequate. So the ancient system sought to purify the channels of this communication. It was assumed that if the individual was able to completely disentangle self-interest from knowledge that he would be in the most favorable condition to possess true knowing. If, however, self-interest
exist of any kind uh, existed, it threatened the integrity of essential knowledge. Thus, while knowledge from within is the most pure in principle, knowledge from the outside is often the most effective in practice. For example, the individual under the normal conditions of life may never be able to intuit or gain from within himself as clear a concept of knowledge as he can read from Socrates. Not because he couldn't, but because he lacked the integration which made possible the communication of this knowledge. He even lacks the thought forms by means of which he could embody this knowledge in practical ideas. He lacks the ability to rationalize the very impulses of knowledge that might come to him. Therefore, while it is true that the mystic, in a pure state of subjective insight, can receive a pure stream of knowledge more clearly, more intimately, more immediately than he can ever receive it from the outside. This is not true of the average person. It is not true of the average person because he lacks a trained instrument. Now we may say that when someone like Socrates puts his thoughts into words and these words are translated into another language and we finally read them, that there have been many opportunities for errors to creep in that we are far removed from even Socrates as a basic source of knowledge. This is true. But it also remains true that human experience has shown us that even with these restrictions, limitations, and imperfections, the average person living the average kind of life and with the average degree of internal development cannot equal of his own thinking the wisdom of Socrates. He simply is not able to do it. He lacks uh, the internal development which makes this possible. Therefore, it is sometimes better for man to choose a good teacher from the outside until he is able to integrate his own psychic organism, until he is able to find that perfect temperance of the soul which the ancients call the climate of enlightenment. While this individual is subject to temper fits, depressions, spells and attitudes of, intemperance, of an intemperate nature, is burdened with innumerable fixations and problems of this world, has solved none of the immediate and environmental situations that confront him every day. Such a person is in no condition to receive a pure stream of inspiration. Now the answer to that one also presents another question in epistemology, namely the experience that we sometimes seem to have, as in the case of Paul of Tarsus, where an individual with practically no known virtues was the recipient of a divine revelation and that Paul received the vision of Christ when many of the most pious and sincere of, his, of the Christ followers never had any such vision given to them. And yet Paul at that time was on his way to persecute the Master. I think the answer to this has to lie in a chemistry which we cannot solve in a one-life theory. The experience that came to Paul came as the result undoubtedly, of a long uh, previous record of karma. Actually, Paul was a sincere man. He was doing what he believed. He had not apparently in this embodiment at that time reached the point in which he could transcend uh, the material elements of his personality and received the full psychic maturity which he had brought with him from a past life. Whereas man uh, matures physically and intellectually, say around his 21st year, the average person does not mature psychically until they're at least 30. Therefore, Paul had not picked up his own insight. He had not revived the pattern of his own previous 
barracks as they have been built up. And it was when he received uh, this maturity of his psychic life that he suddenly realized his mistake and repented of it genuinely and sincerely for the rest of his life. But even prior to that, I think the records all indicate that he was a very sincere person doing that which he believed to be right. And this was important in his karma. Now, in the same way, under certain conditions, individuals who apparently have very little claim to spiritual maturity have apparently had authentic spiritual revelation. Epistemology faces this problem also. It points out of certain conditions which can arise within the life of the individual, conditions which have to be lawful even though we cannot fully understand them. One of the problems that uh, seems to play a factor in this is that very often psychic or mystical revelations are found among comparatively simple and untutored people. This may be partly due to the fact that these individuals have not developed the tremendous materialistic intensities uh, which dominate the life of other more sophisticated individuals. Therefore, the simple, the meek, those of extremely humble nature, seemingly are peculiarly suited to receive visions and mystical experiences. Perhaps it is because these simple people have very little selfishness in them. They have never really thought of building a tremendous personal sophistication. I think that was true of Baby, a very simple, pious man who never for a moment questioned the simple faith that he held. He tried to live it. He lived a simple life as a shoemaker. And perhaps by his very detachment from the illusionary pressures that mark more sophisticated existence, he was an available channel. And this availability, again, probably goes back to psychic maturity at a past time. Altogether, in all probabilities, where illumination or the mystical experience seems to strike a person whose qualifications are not obvious to us, I think we have to recognize with the ancients that these things rest with a karmic law that goes back over a very long period of time, and that the working of this karmic law may or may not be obvious uh, to anyone studying merely the external personalities of these individuals. Epistemology also goes into the nature of essential knowledge as to what it is. What is the most essential knowledge that we can conceive of? And I think the only answer that we can positively say to that is that the most essential knowledge is to know that there is a universal or divine plan. That essential knowledge is to know with absolute certainty the power that governs the world and the purposes of that power. From that point on, all growth lies not in knowledge but in obedience. And knowledge must be the basis of enlightened obedience. We cannot obey efficiently or practically that which we do not know. This is the excuse for knowledge. This is why epistemology is important, is that it must provide the individual with the facts needed for the direction of his own conduct in action. If this knowledge is not available, then the individual cannot direct his own life. So the nature of knowledge, the possibility of the attainment of knowledge, and the substance of that to be known, all of these become moral forces in the life of man in his evolutionary growth. Today we have very largely theoretical knowledge. Therefore we have many beliefs that are accepted but are not known. We have some beliefs that are acknowledged, but not vitally followed. 
simply because the individual has not experienced any vitality in these beliefs. As a result of this alone, we have hundreds of millions of nominal members of religious groups who are not practicing their religious beliefs. They may to some degree be trying, but there is no energy in this, there is no libido behind it, because this doctrine, this creed, this code is simply something that has been imparted to them. It is something held in common by many members of a sect. It has never been vitalized by any internal experience. It has never taken on the form or quality of essential knowledge. We therefore can go against our opinions or go against the opinions of others with very little hesitation. But it is extremely difficult to go against that which we internally know by experience. Experience must ultimately convert us all. And experience is either a man's intuitive psychic recognition of truths as a result of the daily processes of life, or experience is man's participation in an overstate of knowing through visions, uh, through inspiration, through intuition, or other extrasensory perceptions. Uh, such knowledge as is derived from the internal has the greater authority, but also presents the greater hazard because we do not know what level this inspiration has touched. We are not sure that it has reached into the core of things. It may only be a psychological pressure arising from some willful purpose of our own, some determination to achieve a goal which is not universally appropriate. So we have to be extremely careful in the estimation of this type of revelation. But it does occur, and all the things being equal, internal experience is the most powerful of all forces. In most religious systems of antiquity, religious experience of this nature, as in Zen and in other Eastern sects, was the result of dedication and discipline. The individual gradually grew in the capacity to receive inner light. He placed his life under the most rigid controls. He uh, detached himself from all artificial or unreasonable pursuits. He simplified his conduct in every way possible. He did not necessarily renounce the world, but he certainly renounced worldliness as a force within himself. He sought to moderate all desires and appetites, and most of all to direct his attention most forcibly and continuously towards those noblest aims and ends which were appropriate. He sought to increase knowledge of all useful arts and sciences. He sought to build all of the intellectual and moral strength that he could so that this could support his spiritual endeavor. Most of all, perhaps, in all these processes, he sought for the gradual renunciation of the sense of selfness. He sought to leave behind, as far as he could, all purposes which might be regarded as self-motivated. He no longer wished to succeed. He no longer feared to fail. He no longer worried about pride. He no longer had any competitive instincts about knowing. His only desire to know was based upon his simple desire to obey the laws of God. When he desired only to obey, to acknowledge, to venerate, when his one and only purpose was to fulfill that which deity desired, and he had no human equation left, then, as Protinus tells us, he approaches divinity. He makes the necessary requirements in his own life. And usually, where we are dealing with mystical experiences, we have a right to examine these factors. And the individual who believes that he has a valid experience must, to some measure, estimate his own character as to whether, so far as he knows, he is a valid person.
whether he is entitled to such experience, uh, whether his own life justifies uh, his receiving a greater knowledge than he presently possesses. If he is not using well what he knows already, there seems to be little reason why he needs more. If he fails in the common things, there is no good reason why he should share in uncommon things. If he has not been able to make his obvious life a, a more orderly and better managed experience, there is no reason to assume that he is in need of extraordinary uh, faculties or powers. So all things have, as uh, the philosophy points out, a reasonableness in them. And epistemology is therefore not only the science of knowledge, it is the science of the reasonableness of becoming able to know. The science of the reasonableness of who knowledge, uh, of who will receive knowledge, how it will be uh, given, uh, what its laws are, how knowledge administers its own estate, and how knowledge in the proper and full course of things becomes the inevitable birthright of every living thing. These are the various phases and departments of epistemology, and through the consideration of them, simply, directly, and honestly, I think we can find that this branch of philosophy makes a valid contribution to our general improvement. Well, I think that's all for this evening. I'll take my sniffles home. <laughs>